Uh, my name is Rob Dixon. I'm the president of the Olmsted Society. I'm very pleased to welcome everyone here for our uh, presentation tonight by Rob Rose, the executive director of the Cook County Land Bank Authority. And I'm going to describe his background in a moment. But I'd like to encourage people to visit the Olmsted Society webpage at olmsteadsociety.org. Uh, you can see what's happening with activities within the Olmsted Society and join as a member. We very much would appreciate uh, people's participation in landscape work days and other activities in the Olmsted Society. Would also like to thank the Riverside Library for partnering on uh, many of our lectures and all the support they provide to the community and the Olmsted Society. So I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight. We're very happy to have uh, Rob Rose uh, here to talk about developments in Riverside Lawn. He's the executive director of the Cook County Land Bank Authority. He previously served as chief, chief operating officer at the Chicago Community Loan Fund and the director of commercial real estate at the Urban Partnership Bank. Prior to his time in Chicago, he worked for the Lind Company and GE Capital. He serves as a board member of the Moon 2 Dance Theater of Chicago, Citibank New Markets Tax Credit Advisory Board, and the Mercy Loan Community Development Entity Advisory Board. He's a past member of Sweet Beginnings LLC Board of Managers, the Law Project Advisory Committee, and the Illinois Department of Transportation Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Revolving Loan Fund. Now, now that's an acronym that would be a mouthful. He's a recipient of the 2017 NHS Community Impact Award, the 2017 Dearborn Realist President's Award, and the 2016 Chicago Defender Men of Excellence Award, and, it, and is a 2017 Leadership Great Chicago Fellow. He has an MBA from Cornell University and a BBA from St. Edwards University. We're very happy to have him here tonight to talk about developments in Riverside Lawn and let's give him a round of applause. I do appreciate the invitation from the Olmsted Society and the library. Thank you for uh, sponsoring this event and, and allow me to come out to talk to you about uh, what's happening in Riverside Lawn. And so I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes and talk about uh, my organization and who we are. So uh, I'll spend uh, just a few minutes talking about the organization, uh, the, the Cook County Land Bank Authority and what that means and what that is. But the majority of this talk is going to be focused on what's happening in Riverside Lawn. And then I want to leave plenty of time for, for uh, questions and answers that you may have about what's happening. So the, so well, here's the overview, right? So what is a land bank? So we are a fairly new organization. Um, a land bank, in general, speaking, is a public authority or a nonprofit that is created to acquire, hold, and dispose of assets. So if you think about the county in general, we have about 60,000 vacant uh, properties. That's vacant land, abandoned buildings, vacant um, office spaces, industrial buildings, right? And my organization was created specifically to uh, acquire these properties, warehouse them, and get them back online to productive use. So that's, what, that's our day job. Um, in addition to that, we do projects like Riverside Lawn, uh, which I'll go into more detail in terms of how that fits into our strategic vision. But overall, it's an organization that has an expertise in real estate, community development, and land use. Um, we were founded in 2013, so we're a fairly new organization organized under the office of the president, uh, Tony Preckwinkle. But I do uh, report to an independent board, and that gives us the ability to be strategic and to be nimble and to be responsive. Um, and we are freed up somewhat from political pressures around decisions we make around the projects that we are involved in. Uh, right now, we're an organization that receives zero tax dollars. So what funds our operations is, are the proceeds of the sales of the properties that we acquire. So we acquire them, we clear title, and then we sell them at a discount to developers, to homeowners, to nonprofit organizations, and those proceeds help to fund our organization. So I'm proud to say that we are an organization that is, that is working for the public good, but we're not 
a drain on the public resources. Uh, and so that's a delicate balance there. Uh, but it's an important one because we think that our function is, a, is, a, is, is an important function. I've included the logos of other land banks across the country. Uh, so this is not something that's unique to Illinois. Uh, Detroit has a land bank. As you can imagine, when they went through their bankruptcy, they had to find a way to deal with all of the vacant properties they had in Detroit. Uh, Genesee County was one of the first land banks. That's Flint, uh, Michigan. Um, Fulton County, which is Atlanta. Uh, Lucas in Ohio and Cuyahoga also in Ohio are land banks around the country that are dealing with a lot of the same problems. Coming out of the recession, um, it uh, really caused a, a lot of foreclosures. A lot of people had to move out of their homes. Subsequently, businesses then went under because people lost jobs and, and weren't able to support those businesses. Um, and then here in the Midwest in particular, we have a lot of industrial assets as the manufacturing jobs have gone away, those industrial uh, assets then became underutilized. And so that need is something that you'll see as a common thread with all the different groups that I've represented here. And across the country, there are more than 100 land banks. Uh, our land bank is fairly new, but land bank as a concept has been around for about 30 years. So again, the mission is to reduce and return vacant land and abandoned buildings into reliable and sustainable community assets. So simple sort of mission statement, the devil's in the details, and part of the detail tonight is what I'm going to talk to you about Riverside Lawn. So in Riverside Lawn, we have a very unique uh, situation. Rose of a land bank, I'm going to skip over this slide, just jump right into Riverside Lawn. So what happened here is uh, in April 2013, uh, we had some of the worst flooding, some of the hardest rainfall and worst flooding that we've seen in the region. Uh, and, and, uh, in a while. Um, so uh, two-day total uh, was, a, was a record uh, as recorded at O'Hare. The displayed River here crested at 11.42 feet, um, which is its highest recording on record um, as far as I could research. Uh, and as a result, you had a lot of homes that were flooded uh, in Riverside, uh, lawn in particular, this area, has been prone to flooding. And those of you who live in the area know the area well, understand because of the curve of the river as a river uh, uh, crests, it just over, overruns that area and floods that whole, uh, that whole little pocket there, Riverside Lawn. And this is something that the residents have been dealing with for a long time. Um, as I was initially uh, 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 brought on board for this project, um, you know, I did a quick Google because I was just curious as to what was happening in the area and very surprised to see Tribune articles back in the 19 teens uh, about flooding that was occurring in Riverside Lawn. So this is something that's been an ongoing problem for a long time in the region. Uh, part of what happened from that is the governor declared a state of emergency. The president concurred and that freed up a lot of uh, state and federal monies to come in to say, Either can we solve the problem or can we then remove people from the problem? So MWRD, the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, they did a cost benefit analysis of what engineering solution could be done to, uh, to dam the river, levy, or some other thing that could be done. And what they determined is that they had no engineering solution that would stop the flooding. They could slow it down but they couldn't stop it. Even if they spent 20 or $30 million on it, that, that solution didn't exist cost effectively, right? Um, on the other side, um, there were HUD funds that were created through the Community Development Block Grant Program, so known as CDBG. These are federal dollars that flow to either the county or to municipalities, and it's to help with a number of things, including infrastructure. There was a part of this that was carved out for disaster recovery, and specifically, it was to help buy damaged properties that were in floodplain areas and to help residents relocate to a non-floodplain area. And so it's that provision that um, this program, this strategic buyout program uh, in Riverside Lawn occurred. So why Riverside Lawn? Initially, there were some residents in Riverside Lawn that reached out to the county commissioner, and asked what could be done because we are getting flooded. 
and we're getting flooded repeatedly. And can somebody buy us out or can somebody help? So that was communication that was received at the county level. And um, as we were going through and trying to figure out which areas of Cook County we would be applying this, this federal monies to, uh, Riverside Lawn quickly uh, rose to the top of that list in terms of communities that need to be at, at a minimum considered and, and at best that we could actually enact the program. So throughout the county, uh, in Wheeling Township, Layton Township, um, uh, in Glenview, there were some, some other pockets that were identified. Those, property, those, those buyout programs were done. They were actually smaller in scope, and they were done uh, in a coordination between MWRD, the county, the Bureau of Economic Development that handles the HUD funding, and that municipality. So what makes Riverside Lawn unique is that it's unincorporated Cook County. So there is no municipality to, to do the role, and that role is to, to alert the residents, to coordinate uh, appraisals, to coordinate offers, to assist in the buyouts. There's no municipality to do that within uh, Riverside Lawn. So the county, uh, the Bureau of Economic Development, then approached my organization, the Cook County Land Bank, to fill that role. And so that's when we got pulled in to say, we know that there's a program that we want to do here, but we need an administrator arm that has uh, real estate experience, land use experience, and can work and interact with residents to be able to do this uh, and, and, and execute on this plan. So that's where then I became involved. Um, so we have two sources of funding uh, working here. We have the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District they uh, have a series of bonds that they've issued, and the proceeds from those bonds are used to fund these sort of projects. And so they allocated uh, $8 million. Oh, well, I'll get to that. They, they allocated $8 million toward this project. Uh, Cook County then had sort of a match, and they uh, allocated $4 million to this project. So there was a total of $12 million that was allocated to the buyout program. So the buyout program, the way it works, uh, we had a series of meetings here in, uh, in Riverside, uh, actually next door at the town, at the town hall. Um, we had an initial meeting to gauge overall uh, interest. This is a voluntary buyout program, and I want to make sure this is very clear. This is not eminent domain. We're not kicking you out of your house. Um, we're not threatening you out of your house. There is no reason to move if you don't want to move. However, the reason these funds are here is because there's a problem that's been identified, which is we can't stop the flooding. And if we can't stop the flooding, the next solution is let's pay you fair market value for your house so that you don't have to deal with the flooding. The realities of it is that your flood insurance is astronomical and it keeps going up um, as you live in an area that continuously floods. Um, that's how the insurance is going to work, and they're going to continue to escalate those claims. Uh, FEMA also uh, has a list called uh, the repetitive list or the severely repetitive list, uh, which tracks how many claims that you're putting against FEMA. Uh, and again, part of it is as an area to qualify for this funding that you had to have a certain amount of severely repetitive claims that were being put in, into an area, into a census tract. That was part of the criteria. So the whole point is we have an area that at least seems as if this is something that people would want or at least be interested in, but we had to validate that because it could have been that people came in and it was only those five or six people and everyone else is happy and we don't want to go through a program in which people aren't satisfied with what we're offering. So that initial meeting that took place July 30 of, last, of 2015 was to gauge interest to say, is there really interest in this program? And what we heard was tempered interest, right? Yes, I'm interested. It depends on what, that, what this offer is. It depends on how difficult this process is, right? But if you give me a fair market offer for this, all things being equal, we'd at least entertain and consider it. And at that time, that's all we could ask for. We weren't looking for a firm yes or no whether or not there was enough interest for us to keep pursuing this line. And we got that. 
over 90% of the people that attended that meeting indicated that they were at least interested in hearing an offer and understanding how the program worked. So we started to do that work. So I included this picture here because I believe this was sort of, in my mind, for someone who doesn't live here, but someone who was trying to understand what was happening, um, this picture was one of the homes that we have since acquired um, that showed just how severe the flooding was, right? So this actual fence was underwater and it named at least three instances that happened in the last you know, 30 years in which that was the case. And for us, this is when we were talking through with HUD and getting the final approvals to say, here is what we're dealing with, right? This fence is, this is not a two foot fence, right? This is not a, uh, 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 this is not a, uh, a toy fence or a play fence. This is a, a standard sized fence and, and water has gotten up to that level, you know, repeatedly over this time. And as we know, you know, floodplains are measured in how many incidents within a hundred years would this happen, right? Um, and in this situation, this is at least three instances that are highlighted here. But if you go back and do the trip Google, you'll see there are at least seven instances that have happened since 1900 to now. Um, so again, part of it was that we thought we had an uh, issue there. And what we wanted to do is now make sure we had a solution that would appeal to the residents of Riverside Lawn. So the way this works is there's a bond issuance from MWRD, $8 million. The HUD funds came in at $4 million. We were brought in as the administrator to run the program. So we had the initial conversation, and then we had a series of follow-up conversations around the process. Now, because there was no municipality involved, and because we were a fairly new agency, I will say there were fits and starts along the way with the residents. Um, initially, we thought we only had to do one appraisal because that's what's required by HUD. But MWRD came back and said their process required two appraisals. And we found that out fairly late in the process because we had already started appraising the houses and we were done with the first round of appraisals. So we had to go back and schedule the second round of appraisals. We also had to establish an arbitration process so that um, there was an average of the two appraisals that was done to generate an offer based on that. But we also knew that we needed some room to uh, negotiate those offers. And in fact, HUD required some sort of uh, arbitration process. So it wouldn't be just take it or leave it. There had to be at least some negotiation bounded by the appraisals that were done. The other thing is that the appraisals had to be done as of April 1st, 2013 which is a really awkward way to do the appraisal because as you all know and have had appraisals done, they're typically based on fair market value as of today or as of the time frame in which the appraisal is done. So we had to go back and work with the appraisals to, to come up with a consistent methodology to determine what the value was right before the flood. That was, required, that was a required part of the, of the regulations that it happened at that time point in terms of determining fair market value. Um, and so we worked through that with the two appraisals to come up with that number so that as we're going through, there were a number of people that said, hey, I have an appraisal here and it's worth more after the fact or after some renovation work had been done or some other things that occurred that, that weren't considered here. So again, some fits and starts around what that value was and how we had to determine it. Uh, but all things being equal, we have worked our way through this process. And where we are today is we're about halfway through um, the process uh, in terms of the buyout program. The other thing is that what we have to do per the sources of funds, once we acquire the houses, we have to demolish the houses. Okay, and I'll talk about that in a minute in terms of where we are in that process. Um, but what's required to demolish the houses is a historic review. So as you, as you, as you know, many of these houses were built at the turn of the, the 19th, I'm sorry, the 20th century, right? So late 1800s, early 1900s. So it was possible that these houses could uh, qualify for the National Registry, Historic Registry. So there is a process you go through with the state to certify if that's true or not. And that's required so that we don't in, uh, in, you know, tear down 
a historic landmark. And so that's a required part of the, of the process before we can demolish a house. And where we are right now is we're in the midst of that review. We're winding up that review. And I spoke with the University of Illinois is who we engaged to do that review. It took a lot longer than they told us it would. Um, there was a lot more research that they had to do. Um, and then they had to coordinate because they actually had to come and see each house. But out of that, um, I think that we're going to get the clear. I don't think there's any houses that qualify for the National Registry. Um, that's the initial indication. We'll get the actual report. Even if the house doesn't qualify for the National Registry, there may be a set of recommendations that we have to do. There may be elements that we may have to preserve from a house, um, windows or doors or, or molding. Um, or there may be a certain way that we have to dispose of it, depending on the materials used. So we'll get that, those set of recommendations. And once we have that, we can then proceed to actually start to demolish the houses that we have acquired. And the final thing is that all of the land, once we demolish the house, um, that land eventually then will be deeded over to the forest preserve. And that land will then be permanently restricted to open space, OK? That doesn't mean you can't ever build anything on it. The Forest Preserve certainly can put up temporary structures. They can put playgrounds up. They can do bike trails. They can do things on the land. But it must be designated open space, so it can't be developed for residential or commercial use. Uh, and that's a permanent deed restriction that goes against the property. Um, so the Forest Preserve already owns the land that borders the river. And so this would be an extension of the property that they already own, and then they would be the caretakers of that land. So this is a map of the area, and I'm going to use my, my pointer here. I don't want to, uh, is this back on? No. OK. So, uh, so you guys are familiar with this. So the bridge is right here, right? Um, actually, right here is Stanley Avenue. Um, and so we're somewhere over here. Um, and so. This marks the 100-year floodplain. And then MWRD has another boundary called the inundation boundary, which means that you know, water doesn't know that that's the 100-year floodplain. <laughs> right? And so it tends to drift. And so they determine that even as it floods, this is the area that's really affected by what's happening. So as you can see, that's really all of you know, uh, Riverside Lawn that's affected by the flooding that happens. So it's a fancy way of saying what you already know. When it rains, it floods here in this area. And it floods pretty extensively, right? Um, and so what we had to do is 46 parcels. And as you look, you'll see that there's more than 46 pins involved here. Part of what we had to do was we had to look at what was a buildable lot. So for example, one person owns these two lots here. We, didn't, we had to package these together because the person buying this would never buy just the one lot, because the one lot is not buildable uh, according to the zoning code. They would have to buy both lots in order to build on it. So when we make an offer, we make an offer on the two lots as a, as a unit. The same thing happens with houses. For so some of the houses, they have a, another lot adjoining it for a side lot, but that was necessary to have enough area to build the square footage of the house that was on that lot. So these squares represent the house or structures that are on the properties. Uh, and then the boundaries represent the pin numbers. But we have the addresses that show, like in this case, this is two pins represented by this one address in terms of how we made our offers. So there were a total of 46 transactions to do you know, with how we had to divide up Riverside Lawn you know, to be consistent with the zoning and consistent with the HUD and MWRD regulations. OK, so that's the total scope. So in 100% in, in, in compliance, every house and structure here would be purchased and then demolished. And this entire area would then become forest preserve if, the, if that were to happen at 100%. But as you know, this is a voluntary program. And not everyone is going to want to move, even, even with the flooding that happens. And of course, the houses along 39th Street are not as affected by what's happening as some of the other houses. And so we expected that there wouldn't be 100% compliance, although our funding presumes that um, as, we, as we proceed. So here's where we are right now. So 
The houses that we have in green, and I don't know if this green shows up very well, but here are the houses here in green. These are houses that we have already acquired. So these are houses in which we've made the offer, we negotiate with the homeowner, and the homeowner has now sold the house to us, and now the Cook County Land Bank is entitled to these houses. These houses are all secured, and we've had some issues with a couple of houses that people have been partying in and consistently sort of getting into. Um, and we've been working with the sheriff and, and our own property preservation company to better secure the house. Um, we, don't, we didn't want to come up with a heavy border presence in your neighborhood. I mean, at the same time, we do want to discourage people from coming in um, and squatting and or you know, vandalizing the house in a way that's not conducive. And what I mean by that is even though we're going to tear down the house, no one wants a ruckus party in a vacant house and all the activities that come with people partying in and getting into these vacant houses. And so we still secure these houses for that reason. So we're not concerned about them taking anything of value, but we are concerned about whether or not they're gonna be a disruption to the neighborhood. Okay, uh, so this house here in red, this is a house that we are expecting to acquire. The, only, the owner of this house actually passed away, and now the um, public guardian is in receivership of this house. There's a court process to go through to convey this to the, uh, uh, the uh, um, heirs, the beneficiaries of the uh, state. Once that happens, we already have an agreement with those beneficiaries to then purchase the house. So we're just waiting on a court process to convey that authority um, to have it go through probate and to go to the beneficiaries, and then we'll be able to, um, to acquire this house. And so right now, uh, as court processes do, they, they take time. We by now had expected to acquire the properties and what, the one lesson that we've seen from all of this is that everything that we've expected has taken longer than we expect. Uh, but what I can say though is that we've been diligent about moving this along um, and, and so we will acquire this house. It's a, it's a matter of time uh, that we'll acquire it and then at that time we'll be able to uh, keep moving on. This is not going to stop us from executing on our demolition plan, um, but we can't tear it down until we actually acquire it. But um, this may then slip to a different phase of our demolition if we don't acquire it within the next you know, month or so. Okay. Um, so right now we've had 24 houses, so there's 46 in total, right? So we've had 22 except, so 22 people who have taken the offer, and 24 people who have either declined or no response. Now, from the declines right now, it's actually 11. So there's 11 people that affirmatively said, I do not want the offer, period. I'm not interested in moving. I don't care how much money you offer me, I'm not moving. The other 13 have not responded. Some of it, we know people are out of town. We've been trying to do track searches to find out who, you know, we have what's on record, and then there's the realities, and they don't always update the records. And, uh, and then some people have sort of checked out, uh, and we want to track them down to see who owns it and to get the offer into the hands of a, the person who can make the decision. We also expect that as we start to actually demolish, there may be some people who say, well, I thought I want to live here, but when they actually take down these houses, that means that they don't have, those aren't barriers to the water coming in, and so I may be more affected by the flooding, so maybe I'll consider that offer that you guys gave me. Uh, some people have come back and there was an offer we gave and they say, well, it's compelling, maybe, and so maybe a year later, that same dollar amount, or maybe even a, a higher dollar amount, may be more appealing now. And so we'll go back and revisit the 13 and say, okay, now that we're through our phases of demolition, are you sure you don't want to accept the offer? Are you good with staying here now that you see what things look like now that we've demolished the homes? Um, and again, this is not, uh, we think we're helping. So, uh, and you know, 22 homes have said, yes, we appreciate it. We take you up on your offer, we are moving out. Um, but if, if this is all that happens, this is an okay result for us. You know, the forest reserve will then just sort of man, meander through here at what's happening. There are some options that we can talk about if you don't take the offer, what could happen um, in terms of how this land could still become forest reserve land 
as you move out, you won't get the offer, but there is a process by which that land can still become forest preserve land. Uh, but what we, uh, what we uh, uh, want to be is flexible. We do have a spending deadline for the funds. And so we want to make sure that everyone involved understands that we do have a deadline by which the funds have to be expended or returned back. And so right now, that deadline is going to be mid-2018. Um, we're getting guidance from HUD as to what the exact deadline is. Then we're going to put a deadline sort of before that so we don't run up against it um, so that if people are interested, they can, they can take us up in the offer. But we want to also move in such a way that what makes sense here and what makes this cost effective in a, in a good use of these federal dollars is that we'll be able to do uh, many homes at a time as a, instead of one home at a time. That's always more expensive to move the equipment back and forth. So we're going to try and bundle these together in a way that makes sense. Now, with that being said, we recognize that this is a small area. Um, and these trucks and these equipment is big, and these roads are tiny roads. So we're not going to have all houses knocked down. We're going to do it in phases. And there's only going to be one demolition crew in the neighborhood at a time. OK? So phase one, two, and three, and what we're doing is we're starting closest to the river near the, near the back of the uh, 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 subdivision, the area, and then working our way toward 39th Street. So that's the idea. And then what we're trying to do is we wanted to bundle these in such a way that it would be good economies of scale for the demolition crew to come in, set their equipment down, and be able to do the, the houses at, you know, at one time. Um, as part of our bid process, what we ask is that they be able to complete this work um, once they actually get trucks on site, that they actually complete this work within a two to three week time frame. So, you know, this isn't designed to be something that is there for three or four months, that they're able to come in, they're able to uh, demolish the houses, um, and then they're able to get out of the neighborhood, and then we can rest, and then we'll come back and do phase two, rest, and then come back and do phase three. Um, we want to be as least disruptive as possible within the neighborhoods, um, and we want to find a way to do that. We'll make sure there's plenty of notice before we start each phase of construction. So we are, we'll be working with the, the uh, the Cook County Department of Buildings and Zoning and their inspectors. We'll be working with the Riverside uh, Township Assessor. Uh, Fran has been very helpful in helping us with the communications. Um, we have our guys out, so we'll be peppering you. So anyone that lives in this area, it won't be a mystery that on X date, we're going to start the demolition process. Uh, but we do want to make sure that that's clear and we can communicate that. And we're going to use a variety of methods to do that. Um, but if you have a question and you guys aren't shy about calling me, uh, give us a call and then we'll be able to give you that schedule as we start to lay it out. Are you going to hand out cards with your name and phone number on it? Uh, I, I can. Thank you. I will. I don't have enough cards to everybody, but um, I can also give you my name and information. If you want to write it down, you'll have it. And we'll go from there. No problem. Um, so as you can see right now, we have this left out. We're hoping that this can be a part of phase one. And we can add that in there. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, but we'll see. Again, it's, it depends on the timing of, uh, of the court system when we'll be able to, to be able to move this house. There was a, someone, I don't know, not sure if you're here or not, someone had asked our office if they could buy a house and then have it transported to another location because they thought the house was a great house and wanted to save it. Uh, and we went back to HUD, and HUD said they'd never gotten that request before. So they ran it all the way up to D.C., and D.C. came back and said that that was not an eligible use of the funds. So unfortunately, the house has to be knocked down. The only action that would have done that if the house were in the National Registry, then that is a possible action to take to save the house. Um, but that house that was in question wasn't a part of the four houses that we um, had to do and a, a more extensive review on. So we did a scan of all of the houses in the area. Four houses came back as possible candidates. And those are the four houses that are holding up the demolition process right now in terms of us being able to move forward and get that clearance from the state that we um, are in compliance with the regs and we can move on with the, with the demolition. Um, those four houses are what? 
the four houses were tagged as possible candidates for National Registry, uh, National Historic Registry. And so there's a, there's a more extensive review. It's called a historic survey. They have to come out. They had to do more research. They had to come out and actually document those houses, take pictures, and, and do some field work. Um, and they're going to give us a final report on those four houses. So that's what we're waiting on to start the demo process. So uh, So those houses are uh, this house here, uh, this house here, uh, I'm trying to remember the addresses. Uh, yeah, one. Yeah, this, this, I already said this house here, right? Yeah. This one here, this one here. I believe this may have been possibly one. Yeah. And there's a fourth one. I don't remember the address off the top of my head. Um, but, you know, sort of the ones that you think are old and uh, may have some significance. It was, it was four, but those are the three I remember. I can't remember the fourth one that we're waiting on. Um, so, so that's where we are right now in, in that process. So as soon as we get that clearance and as soon as then we can get the permits, because we haven't been able to pull permits, or we haven't had them pull permits yet, uh, you know, because the permit's only good for so long. So as soon as we get that clearance, then uh, the demolition companies will pull permits. Then we will do the notice to let you know uh, when we expect to have uh, the companies going and when we'll start to time out, you know, phase one, two, and three. Um, again, we'll clearly communicate that to the residents as we go through to do the demolition here. So what are, where are we at the next steps? So we, wanna, we need to complete the demolitions, right? Uh, the scope of the demolitions is that we knock down the houses. Um, part of the offer that people received, um, if there was any element that they wanted to retain in the house, they were able to do so. So people wanted to take some, uh, some, some things out of the house. We could do it within reason. Things that were structural that would compromise the integrity of the house, uh, we didn't want them, so we didn't want them to take out windows, for example, um, you know, because we still wanted to have a window there. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we didn't have a health safety issue uh, before we could knock it down. So, but within reason, people were able to take railings and ceiling fans and other things in the house that they had either put into the house or they thought were, had some significance, doors, um, as long as it was an exterior door, they could take it off, things like that. So um, we're going to go through, and it's going to be a demolition, um, not a deconstruction. So we won't be taking the houses apart. This will be a wrecking ball, knocking the houses down with an ATN operator, you know, collapsing the house, gathering up with big dumpsters on site to uh, haul that, 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 that debris off. Um, and we also have to remove the foundations as part of the, uh, as part of the scope. And we also have to remove the septic tanks. So all of that will come out. Um, and then we have to uh, then seed the property. And that's a part of the federal regulations on how the demolitions are to be conducted. Um, so everything goes. We will not be tearing up the road. Um, the Forest Reserve has asked that the roads may be, uh, be intact, that it has some value, and that saves them for future costs. You know. Uh, assuming that at some point all this becomes forest reserve, uh, they ask that we maintain the roads. So the roads won't be, uh, won't be removed. Uh, so the individual uh, foundations and septics will go, but not the roads. Um, concurrent with the demolitions, we're also going to confirm these no responses. So at some point, we need either a firm no or a firm yes um, so that we can move forward. We're going to establish this hard deadline, and we're working right now with HUD to get that deadline established. And then at that point, any no response will then turn into a no once we hit that, hit that time frame. Yes, sir? Um, utilities are going to be removed. Oh, I'm sorry. All the utilities will be removed. Yes, sir. So. And I have one other question. If you can go back a slide to the, to the uh, map. Yes, sir. There's some kind of a, uh, some kind of a structure here, uh, some kind of a pump structure. That's, uh, that's built there is, uh, what is, what is that and what is the future of that? So I'm not sure what that is, but you know that the village of uh, Lyons has uh, some public works facilities here that may be related to what they have here. So I'm not sure. It looks like that's water. sort of, huh? Water, water main point for Lyons. Okay, yeah, so that's beyond the scope 
we won't be touching anything like that. So our scope is limited to the houses and the foundations, septics on, on site. Uh, anything else, we will be leaving intact. So the roads, any other infrastructure that, that lines or anyone has, we won't be touching those things. Okay. Um, finally, once we have that, once we have the finalized offers, and we know all the houses that we've acquired, and then we've demolished all the houses, um, at some point it will be a one-time conveyance of all those pins and properties to the Forest Preserve. So it won't be piecemeal. It will be a one-time conveyance that we do. Um, that conveyance does require, you know, approval from the Forest Preserves. Now, of course, we didn't go into this without knowing that the Forest Preserve is open to receiving this, but there is a formal process that their board has to adopt a resolution to take it. It's going to be, I don't know, ceremony is not the right word. They know it's coming. Uh, they're anticipating it. Uh, but it is, a, it is a, a, a step, the necessary step that we have to do to convey it to the Forest Preserve. So that will happen at one time, and then they will then be the owners of the, of the land and then responsible for its upkeep. Yes, sir? Since, since we can ask questions, I noticed on the previous slide, on the right-hand side, there's, there's an actual property that's owned by Riverside. I thought it was all unincorporated peninsula. But on the right-hand side. Here? No, no. On the other end. Oh, yeah. Right hand, yeah. It says Village of Riverside. So Riverside yeah. actually owns that property? No, no, no. I'm sorry. This is the property. This is the, this is the boundary of Riverside. So this Village of Riverside, this is just showing you the boundaries, and this is the Village of Lyons here. So this part here is unincorporated. No one actually, the, there's no township that actually owns this. No, well, but the, that peninsula to the right side. Here? Is the, well, the, the pale green there, up a little bit. Up, 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 yep, right there. Okay. Is that Riverside? No, this is Forest Preserve. Well, then why does it say Village of Riverside? No, no, no. The Village of Riverside, this, the, like, this is Village of Riverside. This is the boundary. And this right. is the boundary for the Village of Riverside. Right. So the, so the Village of Riverside is the municipality. You own your house. The village doesn't own your house. The Forest Preserve can own the land in the Village of Riverside. This is, this is Forest Preserve land that borders the river. It owned by the Forest Preserve. But it's, the part, village, but it's part of Riverside. But it's part of, of the village of Riverside. Right. Huh. Like your house. You own your house yeah. in the village of Riverside, as opposed to owning your house in unincorporated Cook. So the Forest Preserve owns this. Uh, owns, there's a border, and I don't have the borders of what the Forest Preserve owns, but they have all of this land that borders the river here. Um, and this is, so this is why they were a natural partner to just continue to acquire the properties from what they already own. So from that bridge on as, you know, as you're walking through, you'll see clear signs that Mark just said, you know, Forest Preserve and is what they own. Um, and then finally, and this has nothing to do with you all, but there's some compliance paperwork. So there may be uh, a, a time that we reach back out to some of the residents as we've gone through, we've tried to be very judicious about gathering all that we need um, at the time of closing. Um, but um, we've already got some preliminary indications from HUD that there may be some additional paperwork that we may need to get from people who have accepted offers and moved on. Um, the HUD regulations say best efforts to collect this paperwork because this is stuff that was actually required after we had started the process. So we didn't know going into it that we needed to do that. Um, so we'll, we'll complete that compliance and, and do what we can. So if you do hear from us, it's not a prank. We're not asking for the money back. But we may need to get a tax return or something of that nature to paper the file to complete um, our compliance requirements with HUD. Um, so um, you know, closing statements, permits, you know, we have all this stuff, pictures. There may be other documentation. But we'll be very clear about what we need. Um, we'll make those best efforts to get it from you. If you don't have it um, or you can't put your finger on it, then maybe an affidavit that we have you sign that says unable to locate this document. Um, or for like tax returns, you can just sign a release um, that allows us to, to get the tax returns from the IRS uh, for things like that. So um, there'll be some final wrap up that we have to do to close this out. And this will be, you know, uh, these things, I got them sequentially, but these things are happening. These two things are happening at the same time. Now, this is a one-time event for the conveyance, and this is an ongoing deal that, that, that we're doing to make sure we're wrapping up the paperwork. So 
from the time that we do the conveyance, my goal is that when we convey to the forest preserve, we've, we've fully complied with all the HUD and MWRD regulations. And then there's a process to close out the bond issuance and a process to close out the federal funding um, so they can tie back to those sources. Okay, any, any questions? Yeah, yes. questions back here. Let me okay. That's all right. It's just for the um, video. Uh, all the uh, homes there are on wells, and we want to know if uh, they're going to close those wells, seal them up in accordance with law so they're not polluting anybody who's left. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So if they're on wells, then, yeah. So I said septic, um, but if they're on wells or, yeah, all, all, we're, we're required to return the land back to um, a natural state, if you will. So remove all man-made structures that on the property. So that's the foundations. If it's a well, um, then we'll be in accordance with the law how we have to treat that. Seal it. Seal it. Yes, absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. A question over here. There's a question. There you go. <clears throat> is, is there a reason that the the land would go directly to the forest preserve and not the township? Uh, because yeah, there is no township. This is unincorporated Cook. Right. It would be Riverside Township. No, this part doesn't own. <laughs> so the the village of Riverside, the boundaries are here. This is not Riverside. This is not the village of Riverside. This is the village of Lyons. This is the river, village of Riverside. So if you look at a Cook County map of municipalities, there's a little white little section near the bend of the river that's unincorporated, that no one owns it in terms of municipality. So right now, the Cook County is the party responsible. So it's the sheriff, and it's the Cook County um, that, that maintains this. Now, the village of Lyons or Riverside may have some agreement around how they handle fire and police from a re response standpoint. But right now, the village act, this is unincorporated. No village right now owns this. Right, no, I, I don't mean, I don't mean the municipality, I mean the actual township. Not, I know that it's not part of a municipality. Yeah, but a, a township, yeah, but a township isn't a municipality. A township um, is an overlay right. government. So yes, it's in the township of Riverside, right. So right. My question was, why wouldn't the land be transferred to the township rather than... Because the townships don't own land. I'm sorry? The townships don't own land. Okay. Right? Well, the municipalities own the land. The township, as an overlay support, you know, so back when townships were formed, it was for fire and, 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 and public works. That was part of the original. That was sort of transferred to the, uh, uh, to the municipalities for the most part but the townships still have an assessor and they still have support services, but the townships actually don't, um, there's no uh, powers to own the land by townships. Um, so, you know, that's a whole nother lecture on annexation and, 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 and that whole thing, but there are uh, plenty of pockets right now of unincorporated Cook, and this is part of the challenge they face is when these sort of things happen, who is then responsible for it? Yes, sir. Um, yeah, on the north end of Gladstone and Washington, there's a bunch of yellow lots there, and there's, uh -huh. are, there's no houses on those? Right. Are, so, I mean, those people could never build a house there, so if you don't acquire it, it's, it's just empty land? Yeah, so it's empty land. So we have been in contact with the owners here, um, and they don't want to sell. Um, they, wanna, they still want to build, um, and legally, we can't stop you from building. Um, there was a moratorium on improvements until we got through this project, but legally, right, and we went to state's attorney to get an, an, an opinion, legally we cannot stop you from building. Now, with that being said, understand that you're building in the middle of a forest preserve, uh, understanding that you may not have these services that, that uh, uh, you know, so you're building at your own risk, if you will, right, um, and that your flood insurance is going to be super sky high, especially once this area has been uh, registered as an area that we have offered a strategic buyout program to. Um, your, your, your flood insurance will be at its maximum amount uh, for, for being here. Uh, but no, I, I don't have any authority to kick you out or to take your land. That being said, 
One of the options that exists that we'll start talking with people about who really don't want to leave, right? But we really would like to see this land become forest preserves. There's a thing called a life estate. So you can put the property into a life estate. So you live on the property, you own it for as long as you have it. And then when you pass away, it conveys to the forest preserve. And there are a lot of people that do that so they can enjoy the house you know, and, and understand that there's going to be limited services and that sort of thing. But they like the idea of living in the forest preserve. And then that house then becomes property of the forest preserve when they pass away instead of going to their estate. And that's something that we can explore and talk through to see if that's something that sort of hits the midway point. Is the forest preserve going to pay you for that land? The forest preserve has a program that they will do some compensation. I can tell you it won't be anything near what we, we've been offering now. But they, they may be, enough, they have a formula, they have a, another way that they could uh, to deter, determine the value. But it's, um, you know, relatively speaking, it's way less than what we're currently offering under our program. But yes, there will be due compensation for that. Um, but it will be, you know, pennies to the dollar to what, to what we're offering. But because remember, my offer goes away sometime in 2018. So my offer is zero, their offer is something and you get a chance to enjoy the, the, the house for the remainder of your days. Yeah, but we still could sell to a private owner, right? You can sell to a private owner if you can convince a private owner to come in and to buy it in a floodplain with high flood insurance. But if an owner, and there's people out there who do it, so I'm not being facetious to say, um, I've, had a, I've had a couple, I don't know if you're here tonight, someone called me and said, I understand what's happening, but it's a really great home and we think we can manage through the floods and so can we buy the house? And I'm like, I can't stop you. So there is a market for people. Now what we know is that that market is not a huge market, but there are people who, who, who say, you know, despite the challenges, it's a great price in a great community. Um, it's, you know, it's a great, I mean, it's beautiful. This area is a beautiful area. So I understand that, um, so we can't stop you. But my point is that there are some options beyond this program if this program really doesn't sit well with you or you say, you know what, I just don't want to move, you know? Um, that there is still some ways, because what we want to do ultimately, you know, if there were all of this government beforehand, and I, I don't know if we got any libertarians here, but if there was any government beforehand, you know, this area would just would have been zoned unbuildable. I mean, because of the flooding. Um, you know, they would have never allowed homes here, but these homes were built well before, you know, um, this government was here. So we've got to deal with that. But I mean, in today's world, you know, we wouldn't uh, even allow that zoning to take place because of the flooding, extensive flooding, that this is, would be a wetland. And it would be, uh, we probably would take even more steps to encourage it to flood, if you will, to serve as a, as a buffer for uh, the rest of the area. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Let me get you the microphone. Here you go. Well, it's just for the video. The microphone's for the video so people oh. can see this later and okay. understand what the question is. So thanks a lot. That was really interesting. And um, I wondered from a perspective of uh, you were talking about the beauty and the wetlands and the natural state. Has there been any study, formal or otherwise, on the, the after, you know, what's going to happen after the demolitions do occur and maybe a projection or modeling or anything, um, you know, what, what the place is going to look like in 10 years or something like that, or 50 for that matter. So, no, so we have not commissioned such a study, but the Forest Preserve, it, it does have a process they go through. Um, the Forest Preserve had, had determined a while back that this was something, this is an area they were really interested in just from that standpoint. Um, but of course, because there was a vibrant neighborhood back there, it was like, this would be nice to have, but it's not possible. So I don't know if they have any studies, but there's no study that I know of right now that studies the after effect to see what that final state would look like um, in terms of what would happen. And I think part of it is you have to know you know, I think it's a different final state if all the houses are gone versus half the houses or a quarter of the houses, right? Um, so we, we just don't know. But um, that would be interesting uh, to see as they follow up what the Forest Reserve plans would be once they are conveyed the property, because I think those plans that they have would incorporate, um, you know, that sort, of, uh, that sort of analysis. And I know that they, they do pretty robust analysis around wetlands and 
and the impact on the environment, that sort of thing, and habitat. So I imagine that that will come into play, but up to this point, they've not done that, to my knowledge. Yes, sir. Riverside built a public works building. Is that, is that, that it here? No, where, 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 I'm sorry, where is it? Oh, right there. Right here, right? No. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, so. What do you, what do you think of that? It's that big yellow spot. Ah. I mean, is it in forest preserve? Yeah, yeah. Is it a mistake? No, no, it's not a mistake. I mean, what happens again, um, if the village owns this, and, and I believe that they do, oh. 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 up over here? No. Yeah. To the left, to the left, right there, that's big square. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this is, again, this is outside of the scope. This was never. That's Riverside. Okay. Yeah, this is, a, this is outside the scope of what we did. So what happens here, this, this wouldn't be conveyed to the Forest Preserve because this is not, what's going to be conveyed to the Forest Preserve are all of the colored uh, non-yellow pins. That was, that's what becomes Forest Preserve. And if people, if more people accept the offers, it'll be these pins. This is outside of that scope. So this would never be Forest Preserve unless the village decides to Convey it to the Forest Preserve. That would be a separate discussion. Hmm. It, it doesn't look like it's in Riverside. It well, this, it's, it's in it's in the village. Oh no! So I the so green. so so so. Uh, your name, sir? It's closer to the river. Trey Van Cura. Trey Van. So what I'm saying, Trey Van, is that's outside of the scope of what I'm working on. So I really I'm not familiar with what is there or what's happening because it's outside of the scope. So we've never looked at this. So I have no idea what's here. And I'd have no idea what's happening because this is well outside the scope of what we're responsible for. I can tell you what's happening here, right? Because these are the homes that we've acquired and what's gonna happen, but this was never a part of our scope. So I don't know. Okay. So that's not owned by the Forest Preserve? No. no. I don't think so. No. I mean, it's, it's like, that's, if, that's if, if one second, one second. If people wanna comment, okay. just raise your hand. I'll bring, I'll bring the mic over. We get time for one or two more questions. The, I'm sure Mr. Rose will stick around to talk to people individually. Sure, absolutely. The village of Riverside okay. bought that land a long time ago. Okay. It is not technically in Riverside Lawn at all. It's considered part of the municipality of Riverside. Okay. But it is not, it does not touch the other borders of Riverside as such. Okay. I mean, any of our built uh, environment. Sure. But. It's also not considered uh, in the floodplain. Yeah, it's considered a riverside dump site. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, again, that's that's beyond the that's beyond my scope. So. <laughs> okay. We have one more comment, and then I, I believe Mr. Rose will. I'll stick, stick around, around after. A absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Here we go. Is there going to be any special protection for some of the trees that are there, the big, old, fantastic, beautiful oaks and some of the others? I've been in touch with American Forests to try to get one of the trees down there uh, designated as a champion tree. Okay. Um, because the canopy, it's just, I, I know there's a canopy protection law uh, that Cook County should be abiding by. Will they be? Absolutely, we're going to be in compliance. I mean, so not only is this, this is unincorporated Cook County, so we are especially bound by our own laws. So absolutely, the Forest Preserve, I imagine, and, and in our conversations with them, our conversations, again, have been very preliminary because we don't have an idea yet of what it is that we actually be conveying, right? But I imagine that the Forest Preserve has a protocol by which they do the survey of the land, they understand uh, what needs to be preserved, the habitat, the foliage, right? Um, and they, they have a process for doing that. And they've acquired over, you know, 169 acres of this. So I, I think they have an expertise in how to do that. Yeah, so if there's a... No, 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 no. So no, 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 ma'am, no, ma'am. We're not tearing down trees. No, 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 I know. I'm saying as they're tearing down the homes, there may be... No, we're... No, no, so... No, no, no. So, I mean, so I, I can't say if a tree is right up against a house or something. I, I don't know. 
but we're going to take care not to tear down trees. We're tearing down houses and tearing up the, the built environment. But the goal here is not to come in with a hacksaw and chop up this community. That's, that's not at all what's happening. Um, and and there's, there's, uh, there's ordinances and there's, uh, there's uh, you know, regulations around the preservation of that. And our companies, are, we're going to hold them to that standard. Uh, so let me be clear what happens. When they come out to do the demolition, they're monitored by the Department of Building and Zonings because that's who's issuing the demo permit. So they're not only there to issue the permit, they also monitor the demolition in, as it happens, and then as a final inspection to be done. Um, and then, um, so there's care to make sure that they're in compliance with all the ordinances. There's also a, a debris uh, removal ordinance uh, called the Triple D ordinance that talks about the waste streams and what you have to do, what goes to recycled, you know, what can then be put into a landfill. Again, they have to be in compliance with that. Uh, but there's a whole process in place to make sure that they're compliant you know, with those things as it happens. So uh, I'm confident that uh, trees won't be torn down. But with that, I'm going to make sure that when we go back and we talk with the Department of Buildings, that we expressly have this as a, as a concern and make sure there's care to be done so we don't accidentally have a tree knocked down. Yes, ma'am. Well, I want to thank uh, Rob for, for coming here tonight and sharing all the information he he has on this topic. He's able to uh, stick around and answer questions individually. Uh, appreciate the care you're giving you this process. It's something very near and dear to this community. And um, I'd just like to offer a round of applause for him coming out. <laughs> Thank you. One final note, we did have a small gift for Mr. Rose in uh, appreciation from Aunt Dianas. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. My wife will appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks. All right.